Good afternoon, and welcome to Straight Talking with Kelly. This is where you'll meet some of the most intelligent, creative, and knowledgeable people from various types of industries. And today I have with me my special guest, Casey Neuberger, who is the VP of HR at Hotel Nico San Francisco. Welcome, Casey. Thank you. Welcome. Before I dive into a conversation with Casey, I want to actually read a little bit about his background. Casey and I today will be talking about the importance of collaboration, and that is something he and I did with a program that I founded called Primed and Prepped, a hospitality management culinary arts program, job mentoring training program that's actually at the Bayview YMCA. So hold on, but listen to a little bit about Casey. So Casey was born and raised in McKean. Is that how you pronounce that? McKean? McCain. McCain, Pennsylvania, a small farming community outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. Casey learned the importance of hard work through farming and holding his first job at the KOA campground at the age of 15. He found his passion for the hotel and restaurant industry by working at the campground and having a strong mentor who was also the owner. Casey fine-tuned his skills for hotel hotel management by attending Mercyhurst University, where he earned his bachelor's in hotel and restaurant management. Excuse me. Shortly after graduation, Casey began working for the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company in Cleveland, Ohio, as a housekeeping manager. Within the span of two years, he was promoted to an assistant director of housekeeping and moved to Boston to work for the world famous Ritz Carlton on Arlington Street. He grew his human resource leadership skills by working for the world class leaders in hospitality industry, working for Sisoto, Hyatt, Mandarin Oriental, Intercontinental, and Hotel Nico. Casey moved to San Francisco in 2008 with the Intercontinental Hotel in San Francisco, helping to position the hotel as a market leader. He joined Hotel Nico five years ago as a director of human resources to manage the full closure and reopening of the property after a multi-million dollar renovation. He was promoted to VP of HR two years ago, and just as the COVID-19 pandemic emerged, he took the role of director of hotel operations. Wow, that's quite an extensive background in the hospitality industry. So, Indeed. <laughs> so, Casey, talk to me a little bit about some of the things that that led you to that after we talked about your 15-year-old being on the campground and then all of these other places. So now here we are, Hotel Nico, during a pandemic. What's going on? <laughs> I think we're trying to do what so many of us within the industry and the travel lodging convention industry are trying to do is to have business back here in San Francisco as individuals become vaccinated and uh, individuals feel more comfortable going out, then we are hoping for an increase in travel and tourism to San Francisco and the Bay Area, um, which eventually will lead to larger groups and the use of the convention center. That's what we are trying to work on and uh, becoming very proficient at that for sure. Huh. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to being able to get back to normal and to get our city up and running again, because San Francisco was the number one tourist spot at one point. Yes, right? that is true. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's really what it's about and uh, potentially focusing on regions or Uh, What are some of the uh, lures that would bring somebody to the Bay Area and to begin international travel? Because that's where a lot of our uh, traveling was was taking place, was individuals that were coming from Europe or from Asia. So how does that uh, reignite and create that passion uh, for travel and to come to the Bay Area again? Patience, my dear patience. I think we just have to, you know, kind of wait it out because we've never been in a pandemic. This is, there's a little bit of excitement into it. And then there's a little bit of horror. So it's kind of like both things because 
the excitement actually for me anyway, is being able to have some downtime working at home where you get to spend a little bit of time doing some self-development. So that's the part that I like. The scary part is, okay, when are we going to get this, our, our economy going again? So, you know, when it's out of your control, it's out of your control. So Casey, you know what's so exciting for me right now, having us here, you will not believe this. <laughs> Do you know February is when you and I connected? No, you and I actually connected on, you know, where we met, right? At the SF State uh, Chop Award. Right, uh, the right, advisory board yeah, members. Yeah, with Janet Sim. But now I want you to know that nine years ago, almost to the same date, it was February the 23rd, 2012, when I came to you, when you were at the Intercontinental, and I said, Casey, because you knew I was working on the permanent prep program. But at that time, I said, Casey, I need to have a hotel room so I can invite people to my interested parties meeting so I can explain to them what I'm really trying to do with permanent prep so people can kind of brainstorm with me and help me get the funding and stuff that I needed. That was on February the 23rd, 2012. And here we are, February, what, the 25th, 2021. So you know what that means. It's another full circle moment for me. And you know those, <laughs> remember when, when, do you remember when we had our last full circle moment? Oh my gosh, it was, it must have been the last primed and prepped Iron Chef competition. That's it. That's it, because we were back at San Francisco State in the Vista Room. I'm just yeah. like, you know what? You could not create a better story than this, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely an exciting story. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we're going to actually kind of delve into that a little bit and talk about the magic that we, we created. So before I talk a little bit about, okay, so I I had founded Prominent Prep Man, it was in the late 1990s, very late. And I don't want to give a shout out to a lot of people because I don't want to hurt other people's feelings because there's so many people that help with this program, as you know. But some of the main people, of course, was Dr. David Jones, who actually came to me and says, Kelly, we don't have a lot of African-Americans in this program. We need to get some more people. And I'm thinking, why are you telling me? This is your school. Make it happen. And so I suggested that he meet with Dr. Honeycutt out at City College because she and I were working together at the time. And then she's so cute because she's like, uh, well, you know what? We need to create a program. And she says, but the only way I'll get behind it is Kelly's the instructor. And I'm like, now how did I get in this? And so after that is when I started really thinking, I got to do this. And then that's when I mentioned it in the board meeting and you came to me and you said, you know what, Kelly, if you do this, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. So tell me why, what, what did I say to make you really want to be a part of something that was kind of like in the air? It was a dream. I was, I was thinking about this discussion on my way into the hotel today and, and I thought about this story many times before and I think what makes it so unique and fascinating is that when you told the story and imparted your vision onto the advisory board it was first inspiring Second, it was an aha moment as to, yes, we need to have this program because we do need to address areas within the community that are being underserved to have these young gentlemen that uh, would benefit so much from the program. And three is... Ultimately, that inspiration that you were able to give really sparked something within me that said, hey, you know, I've been looking for how I can get involved in the community as a whole, and this was the perfect opportunity. And I remember the meeting. It was a fall meeting, mm -hmm. uh, which we had two meetings a year, as you recall, and once we got into the beginning of the year, it was this really 
unique opportunity to utilize one of our most beautiful ballrooms at the Intercontinental San Francisco, which was set up for a showing to a prospective client that was coming in. And it was just, everything kind of fell together into these pieces as to how it was supposed to happen. So that's what did it for me. Wow. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That particular meeting was incredible. Darnisha Wright and Jackie Wright. Darnisha was actually my brain part, brainstorming partner throughout the whole process of developing Primed and Prepped, her and Emmanuel Bree. Um, and then Jackie actually came in and she was one of the facilitators of the meeting that day. And we had like, what, 30 something guests that came, different people from different parts of the community, a lot from the Bayview, Hunters Point area, where I wanted to talk about how can I get this hospitality management program up and running to address, and at the time, it was specifically for young Black boys, ages 14 to 19, because I saw where, you know, there was really not a lot of, during that time, statistics being kept on them. There was just not a lot happening for our young Black boys. And I wanted to get them off the streets and into an industry that wasn't opening the doors for us anyway. So the hospitality industry kind of had like a stand back kind of like, you know, I remember one manager told me, I said, how come there's not a lot of African-American workers here? And he says, well, Kelly, we can't find good workers, but they'll ha- they would hire Africans, but not African-Americans. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, well, you know what? I got to see how I can change that. And one of the people that I ended up going to for, for leadership and to mentor me was Rashida. And you know our girl, Rashida, Nairobi. So she was definitely um, a guiding force for me, giving me, you know, um, suggestions and things to do in order to get the program up and running. But your hosting that meeting was the kickoff. But then after that, you know, Tony Brock, who was one of the people that was at the event, took the proposal that I had written and sent it, gave it to Gina Former over at the Bayview YMCA. She was executive director at the time. And Gina told her, she says, call her. I want to meet her because I got a brand new kitchen. If she can do what's really on that paper, I want to meet her. (laughs) And so I'm like, and we came in with a full-fledged program. And a lot of that, Casey, was our working together because you became the chair of the advisory board. And my goodness, you got the hotel industry involved. So let's talk about that and what you did to get them to believe in the vision we were working on. I think that when... you're new to a city and to a community it's about those relationships and forming them and being transparent that I don't know everything um please tell me what has worked in the past and what does it look like for the future these are the needs of the program and talking about it from a place that is very neutral that does not have a lot of um, this is right, this is wrong, you know, let's, you know, what are some of the ways that we can impact um, and be a benefit to one another? And then the trust comes and there has to be trust that uh, if we have a program that is going to educate youth, what is that program going to look like? And do we actually hold our end of the bargain so that when it comes springtime or summertime and students are going into hotels to do internships or in one case I remember that there was um, a young gentleman that actually saved the hotel tens of thousands of dollars by utilizing a previous version of the iPhone and yes it was a culinary program but it kind of it became more of an organic experience. And if the students wanted to try something else or try something that they knew that they would excel at, we would let them do it so that they can yes. become exposed yes. to individuals within the hotel environment. And it just kind of, it turned into 
a very robust program between the hotels, especially the larger companies where there was a commitment every year that they would allocate some of their resources um, for the summer program. And sometimes that would be through the use of the mayor's dollars that were given to community partners to educate and provide internships. And there was also the times when I would be working with the human resources professionals with the monthly meetings and continuing that relationship and building it over time. Really, that's what it took. It wasn't something that just happened overnight, because I remember sure. the program was only, a, you know, when we first did our fundraiser, only had a, you know, a few... 10, 20, 30 people, I think, um, right. to growing to our finale event. And at that point, you could see how the momentum was growing each year and how that was being driven within the community. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things as you talked about, one of the students that actually helped with uh, them saving money, that was Isaac. Isaac was at the Intercontinental, but that was because of you, because he came to me. He says, Miss Kelly, you know, as much as I love culinary and I like this, he says, but I don't want my internship to be in culinary. And I said, well, what do you want? He said, IT. And I knew he was my IT guy because whenever I had computer issues trying to set up something, I'm like, Isaac, come help me out, you know, and he would help me out. And so I said, you know what, Casey, Isaac does not want culinary and you go well, what does he want and I said IT and you goes well let's okay let's see what we can do and you and Peter made that happen for him and then it was even like some of the other kids um you were able to give them you know tell me what you want because remember we had one student that wanted to do concierge and he ended up doing concierge so the opportunities were endless for these guys now, one of my favorite moments when you were at the Intercontinental, even though I had favorites, but the best one was when we did the tour, the, the field trip, when they got to see the Intercontinental, <laughs> and they wanted to see where Obama stayed, remember? Yeah. And you took them to Obama's room, and they're jumping, laying on the bed, and like, oh my God, he was in this room. So that was a real exciting time. Do you remember that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> And you know who our biggest fan was during that time? That was Ricky. He loved the, that, the fact that he was in the room where the president had been. And then when you showed him the elevator that he would go on and stuff when he would come to town. So it was, it, they had some wonderful moments. Now, I remember when I came to you and I said, hey, Case, I want my next fundraiser to be an Iron Chef because Ricky and LaRue used to fight each other all the time. Miss Kelly, who cooks the best? Who cooks the best? And I was like, you know what? I am so sick of you guys. I said, why don't we just have a competition? We're going to have an Iron Chef competition and we're going to find out who's the best. So we had one that we held at the, the Bayview Y and uh, Ricky ended up winning. So he had bragging rights. And then I was decided, you know what? I want to take this differently. So I said, Casey, I want the chefs from the different hotels to compete against each other and use my students as sous chef. Do you remember when I asked you that and you looked at me and you go, Kelly, <laughs> like, really? How, why would they do that? And I said, he says, I don't think they'd do that. And I said, no, you need to ask them. They were more excited than we were, right? Uh, they embraced it and were ready to go. <laughs> yes. Yes. They were so competitive. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh my God, this must be a real chef thing because they really took it serious in the food that they prepared. But you know what the best part was is them using our students as the sous chefs and so many of those students got hired on the spot for being able to participate in that program like that. Yeah, they did. And that was the, <clears throat> that was the year we were at City College Chinatown, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Was, was that the first one? Excuse me for one second. I don't, I'm trying to remember. We've had, so we had five. Because we I were there for that, five years. I, I really yeah. think that that was, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I don't remember where our very first one was, but it was a hit. But the last one was memorable. That one was very, very emotional for me. Um, having David Jones fly in from Southern Cal so we could award him. 
uh, having Foz from Foz restaurants to come. And he was funny when he was like, I, I said, Foz, I need you to bring desserts. He goes, okay. So he brings this beautiful box of desserts from his um, bakery in Danville. And so he said, have the kids played it. So I gave it to the guys in the kitchen and they were just putting it on there. He saw them put it on the table. He goes, stop, stop, <laughs> stop it. And he goes, that's not how you do it. And so he got a plate and he showed them how to do it. He says, now let me see you do it. And then when they finished, they were so proud and, you know, able to display their thing. But it was funny watching him like, how dare you just throw my desserts on a plate like that? So I need to show you how to do this. And it was beautiful. It was such a learning experience for them all over. So now what was your fondest memory? I think um, my fondest memory would have been when we had the event at the former Yoshi's. Oh. Because okay. that was launching that whole space that hadn't been occupied in such a long time. And yes. the kids had to clean up everything, get it ready, and transport items from hotels or restaurants and the competing chefs and really uh, showed what it was like to do an off-site event mm. with them. Yes. And I think that I, I think that each one of the Iron Chef competitions was a valuable learning opportunity, but they weren't equally the same teachable moments. Like there were so many different components that went right. into each one right. that was unique, that made it just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that um, it was even kind of difficult for the chefs, you know, because remember once we got there, we found out the stove wasn't working. So then we were lucky that 1300 was right next door. And they allowed us to to use their their um, facility. So yes, again, David they, Lawrence, because he was yes. only operating in the the front area of the bar, I think, at that time, or no, yeah. doing private events. Yes, yes, and they allowed us to, you know, partnering with us. And I think again, going back to the importance of collaboration uh, was really important. And we had our hands in so many different areas and we had a lot of people supporting us. I remember during the holidays, the Fairmont, Michelle, one of our advisory board members was definitely, Kelly, I want the kids to come and decorate the gingerbread house. That was such a treat. I go along and I had never eaten so many malt balls before. <laughs> Stephanie, <laughs> I was so glad the chef was there you know, guiding the students in terms of, you know, doing the, making sure that they were decorating because I was busy eating the, the, um, the malt balls. So Casey, when I think back to some of the things that you did as some of your duties as the advisory board chair, they were so many on top of your job. So it was like a full-time job because you and I, I mean, we had a serious relationship constantly making sure that things were running right, that we had people on board doing this, that we had funding coming in because we had our own private funding on top of the funding that we got from DCYF. So I just really think that you did a lot. And I wonder, I know what you did, but I want to know if you know what you did. So I want you to tell me, and if you missed something, I'll be able to fill you in to let you know just what you did. Really <laughs> it's really a... a master of the orchestra and <clears throat> working with so many di different disciplines and individuals that needed to come on board, like you said, mm -hmm. that uh, there were meetings, there were calls. As we got closer to events, it was happening every two weeks, every week, uh, yeah. talking to vendors, having individuals that were able to get out and uh, solicit uh, donations and um, auction items and silent auction items to help raise money. I think though that I have been lucky in both of uh, 
my hotels here with Intercontinental and the Hotel Nico is either the hotel has been closed <laughs> <laughs> or I have really great bosses that allowed me the opportunity to sometimes focus on the nonprofit yeah. slash board side yeah. Yeah. Um, and let my full-time job get picked up after the full crunch of what was happening. Well, because, you know, and one of the things that I can see that you left out that was also huge was that your visit to the site, how many visits you made to the site to mentor mm. the students, to teach the classes. You taught classes there with those guys. You were in the kitchen with them, you know, so that took a lot of time as well. And then you took on several of the students that you uh, kind of mentored ongoing. You know, I remember one student lost his knife set and you were just like, okay, let me buy this kid a knife set. And you actually did that out of your own money. You purchased a knife set for this student and it just touched him so deeply. So I just know that it wasn't just the coordinating with all of the other advisory board members, but also the mentoring that you did with the students. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that, you know, you were, uh, they were able to, to reach out to you if they needed something and you were just there for them. So that counts a lot. Cause I think when I think back on the program, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, yeah, I'm the founder, but I was also the program director, but I was also mother, sister, auntie, cousin, <laughs> you, you know, you <laughs> name it, you, you play all of these different roles when you're working with uh, young people. And I've been working with young people all of my career, basically. So it wasn't new to me. Uh, I was just happy to see so many young boys of color come in there, learn the the skills of chefing, and then being able to to get jobs. And I must say that I was very fortunate to have some incredible chefs to work with us. You know, Chef Berlin, Absolutely. who Chef Berlin, the first three years, that's primed and prepped. He really brought those kids to this whole level of what it was because those particular kids, the first three year, they stayed with the program. They stayed with it. And then by year four, they were getting older, going away to college and doing other things. And then we had um, Chef Yaku come in. But in between Chef Yaku, um, we had Chef Kevin. And oh, my God, I don't know why I'm my female chef. Why is that? Oh, yeah. Well, yes. She um, was phenomenal. She was mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, <laughs> I remember I went and sought her out. She was working with. Um, See, this is what happens when you 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 leave. I've been gone for three years now from the program, so I can't. Anyways, it'll come back to me, and I hope she doesn't get mad at me that I didn't forget her name. But it's not that I forgot who she was. It's just right now her name is just escaping me. Um, but she was phenomenal. Uh, I was very fortunate to have all of these wonderful people work with me. But before we leave, I'm going to make sure I get her name because <laughs> I owe her that. <laughs> <laughs> I will find her name. I owe her that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, um, being able to have those wonderful chefs to teach the students what they did, it was incredible. So the collaboration was there. And then just even having the Bay View Y as the home for Primed and Prep. I always called it my gift to the community. I don't think I could have picked a better place to have it. I don't think there was another place that would have given um, Prime and Prep the home that it deserved. And then plus it opened in a brand new kitchen. I mean, you can't beat that. And we're talking state of the art kitchen. Right. So, yeah. So we were very fortunate to have the wise support as well. So it was just a labor of love. Um and I'm just grateful that I was able to have this moment and you and I were able to do it together. And the best part of working with you, Casey, you and I were always on the same page. We were, we never disagreed. We never disagreed, which is unusual when you're working with somebody, right? Always. <laughs> it is, but I think that you have to also look for that, that common ground, uh, right? So, well, we uh, must have found it. Right. So <laughs> we you must just... have. 
you're just like pulling it together and um, making it happen. Yeah. Each day. Yeah, because I think we did a phenomenal job the five years that we both were there. And we both stepped down around the same time. I had always had a five year vision. I remember telling Rashida, because she was like, So, Kelly, what are you going to? I said, You know what? I have a five year vision. I said, I want that program to become successful. And then I'm out. And it became successful to the point where they wanted to replicate it in the other Ys. And then it started getting a little bit bureaucratic. Well, remember, we took all those tours. We drove around to exactly. the Mission Y. And then we went to the Chinatown Y. Um, oh, no, we'd already known what that one was. But they had had some sort of leak or something. So right. they weren't doing it. Right. So there was an, um, another one that we went to. Yes, I think it was in Barcadero or somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, so I am just really thrilled that Permanent Prep, I pray that the program continues to run strong and beautiful. Um, Whole Foods, I made sure that I got a catering van before we left. So I think about Rob uh, making sure, because I had told Rob, I said, Rob, before I leave, I have to have that catering van. I said, because I want to see Prime and Prep continue to cater, but to cater in a way where they can start making their own money. Uh, we were making money catering anyway, but we were just doing small jobs because we didn't have transportation. But now that we got the transportation, you know, I think that that would actually kind of boost their their visibility in the community by having that. Oh, so, absolutely. Anyways, and that was such <clears throat> that was such a great gift. Wasn't it? Foods. Yes. That yes. And it just amazing. Yeah, Whole Food had given us a whole lot. They were like um, permanent prep, you know, because not only did they donate the the van, they hired students. So students ended up working there as well, as well as remember their nickels for bags or nickels for yeah, something, for, yeah something like they that. They donated whenever people would bring a bag into the store, they would, you could either, if you brought a bag, I don't know how it worked, but it was some kind of nickel. If you brought a bag, you... You got they put a nickel into their kind of fund, program. right? And it ended up getting us over seven thousand dollars for that. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, that was amazing. And then look at Michelle when she did her uh rummage sale for uh, the Fairmont, they ended up giving us a really big donation. And then we cannot forget Mr. Man Kim, Man oh, Kim. Yeah. Donations oh. like tens of thousands yes. of dollars every year. Absolutely. And I keep in touch with Man Kim. He's so funny. Uh, he's like, Kelly, let's go. Out. I said, I'm not going out with anybody right now, Man Kim. We're in a pandemic. Okay. I'm sitting close. I said, I'll talk to you on the phone, but I'm not coming to meet you. But yeah, so he was absolutely very generous, very kind. And he did it from his heart. That's what I really appreciated about him. He really wanted the program to grow and to see it grow. So we were fortunate in so many ways. Um, like I said, there's just so many people that, you know, cause I'm thinking about Kevin Carroll right now. So, um, Hunia, 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 Hunia. There you go. Hunia. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would come back, Hunia. It would come. <laughs> Hunia, my chef Hunia. Yes, chef Hunia. I actually remember she was working for the uh i forgot some community program teaching the kids how to eat healthy and stuff like that and somebody had told me kelly there's this lady that's the chef you, you should go meet her so i went on her job one day and when i saw her i was so thrilled because she looked like me and i was like my kids need to see her so having chef punia and then a female you know because my daughter's a chef my daughter's also a chef and she actually came in and worked with the students before so it was just really nice having um, Chef Berlin, then Chef Hunia, and then um, Chef was Yaku. it Chef Yaku, and Chef Kevin. And it was funny because Chef uh, Berlin and Chef Hunia were kind of like the tag team, and then Chef Kevin and Chef Yaku were the tag team. And Chef Yaku is still at the Y. So yeah, it's just amazing. Um, to see the kids, whether they become sous chefs or chefs or not, it doesn't matter, but they learn how to eat healthy. Yes. And that's what's important. And that was the other thing that we did. 
So um, Casey, now we're going to segue out of Primed and Prepped, which was both our loves. I mean, we had a wonderful time with that program. And so what do you, what do you hope for Primed and Prepped for the future? I would love to see it expand and to grow and to continue its impact, allowing for greater opportunities for individuals to get into the hotel industry through the culinary program. Mm -hmm. Or as you mentioned with me, I'm pretty flexible as it comes to careers. So if individuals want to do something different, then you know, we're always looking for individuals that are talented and want to grow and start a career, essentially. So I think it would be amazing to be able to have that um, bench strength and to have individuals launch from that program. And, you know, it was so funny because before I left, I had already envisioned what the next steps for Prime and Prep would have been, and they would have been off the chain. And then COVID hit, but I still believe my thoughts and what I have in mind, what the next steps would have been had I been still there, would have been for Prime and Prep. You know, when you are the creator of something, you know what you want the next steps to be. And I already had that. And I wish that I would have had the opportunity to share that uh, before I left, but I did not. Um, But I know that the why is a really good program and that they will make sure that it lives on. As a matter of fact, I talked to chef Yaku and he told me, Miss Kelly, I'm gonna make sure your program stays. And again, I don't consider it my program. It was my gift to the community. So now it's your program, (laughs) you know, make, make it work, make it work. So Casey, now tell me this, who are the top three people that have inspired you? Uh, um, <laughs> I would say the the owner of the KOA campground. Uh, so my first boss okay. uh, was somebody that really talked about uh, ownership, and even if you're not an owner, you are an owner. And, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just have to make it happen every single day. I would say there was um, my boss at the Swiss Hotel, her name is Victoria, who uh, helped me get into human resources and uh, was able to say to me, even with all the doubts that I had, that it didn't matter what exactly I knew at that very moment in HR, because I can always call another HR director from our company or a lawyer uh, and would be able to get those answered. So I was developed uh, through the training and development avenue, which was really exciting. And um, I think when you, you you talk about um, another person that is either influenced or a mentor is, um, I think I'm going to stay with those two. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Mm-hmm. So it was the camp director and then your former boss, Victoria. Yeah. All right. So what strategy strategies do you use to continue to stay on top of things within your industry? What do you do? So I belong to a society, which is the Society of Human Resources Managers or Management. They are constantly sending out webinars or Zoom trainings that talk about compliance or issues that are happening right now, either within a state or in the country or even globally, uh, because HR is a a global. Um, So that's something that I am constantly looking at. Uh, In addition, I am in the process of getting a master's in organizational leadership. So a lot of the work that I'm doing is research that uh, is leadership and um, 
currently I'm working on, of course, like so many others are, is COVID-19 and the effects that sure. it has on the hospitality industry. So uh, the, that is very relevant and the, the research that I do. Okay, very nice. So now looking back on your life, what would the nine-year-old little boy say to the grown man Casey today? <laughs> I should have just been a garbage man. <laughs> I mean, I should have been like, I should have just stayed on the farm and taken it easy. Um, but that's not really that easy either. But it's just, <laughs> okay. That's what I was ready to say. No, it's just, it's a lot of work, but a different type of work. Mm-hmm. Um, I really think that that boy should have listened to his great aunt when she said, don't wish your life away. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more than wishing what the next position is or what the next degree is or the next promotion or the next increase in salary. Mm -hmm. There's so many more components along the way. Um, And I'm not going to make that mistake moving forward. Uh, I missed out on a few opportunities be, uh, due to that because I was really dedicated to my career mm-hmm. and dedicated to the companies I worked for and the bosses that I worked for. And that was really big for me. And so now it's kind of, okay, well, you know, what's next and what are the next chapters? So. And that was my next question. yeah next chapters are you know i i would definitely like to own something uh be it a uh, an inn or a hotel or to go into partnership with individuals and it's very funny that you talk about this because i was talking to my professor about this very program uh with you and it was if this path takes me on the path of an inn or a small hotel, it would be linked to a VO uh, tech program or a vocational, some sort of learning development um, to prepare students for the hotel industry. So that would be part of it if that's what I do. Now, if it's a restaurant bar, that's something that's a little bit different. Um, and that would have to be based on legalities and things of that nature, but I'm sure that I could work that out. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, looking at it uh, as we move forward. So, but we also, as you said, at the intro to this is that we have to look to the success of our city and our industry and what does that look like and when does that happen what's fantastic for this hotel the hotel nico is we did not close okay and nice because we did not close we don't have to ramp up and we don't have i mean our building is ready to accept you know you could bring in a 250 people into the building and you're um, ready within the rooms you can't right. do that in of course in the ballrooms or the meeting space yet because the city nor the state allows that but as soon as they do it's ready the the everything is scrubbed clean and all the nice. faucets are working and you know we're in the midst of a bathroom renovation <laughs> you know so right. you know there's a lot of exciting things that some of these other hotels that have been closed for a year aren't going to be able to just go and open the door and have people go into the rooms. So that's what we want to do is we want to be able to welcome people as soon as possible and to be able to get individuals in. So I think that that, I think there's a big, there's a big story behind that, uh, Kelly. And um, my journey is also predicated on the success of the, the industry and the hotels and, you know, everything that has to do with tourism. I've been in this industry for over 30 years. So it's, it's kind of in my blood. I don't know what else I would do going back to your question. Like what's the next step? I mean, it is, you know, it is hospitality related. I mean, there is a component also um, that this degree allows me to teach 
at a university level uh, or um, potentially creating a program um, that would help students understand or teach within a high school or something of that nature um, right. because I would have the advanced degree and that's why I really want to go wanted to get it uh, and I was and I was lucky that it all just kind of fell into place sure. during COVID. <laughs> Remember I said that personal development time this is when you start getting you together absolutely yeah. absolutely and just know that whenever you do start your want to start a program you know who to call. Absolutely. <laughs> right programs just like that that's one of my strong suits as a matter of fact when I left Prime and Prep I was already teaching at City and I started getting more classes and my department chair, Natalie, came to me. She says, Kelly, I have this class that I've been wanting to get up and running. It's called Co Workforce Career Essentials. And I'm like, OK, so I created the program. So now I cannot wait. I taught it one semester and now I'll be teaching it again in the fall. So that's one of the things I, you just tell me what kind of program you want to have. And I don't know how I got that gift, but it is a gift to be able to, and I guess because I have worked with young people for so long, and I really kind of know what their needs are. Um, and that's that's something that I really, I love working with young people. I really like giving them the tools and resources that they need to get their lives in order. Yeah. You know, because life is no joke. Uh, but when you have people behind you and giving you what you need, it makes it a little bit easier, right? Yes. So Casey, before we leave, would you please give me three simple interviewing tips on Zoom that would give people the, an upper edge when they're interviewing? Since you're an HR person, what, what are some of the tips that you can offer to people? Ensure that the resume that they are using is really tight and really strong. And what I mean by that is that it has the proper grammar, it has the proper fonts that are being used throughout the entire resume, and it's not uh, in different font styles. There are no spelling errors. Uh, it's just really, really, really great uh, information, and to have a couple of people review it uh, to make sure that that's what it is. Preparing for an interview or being seen uh, on LinkedIn or any of the recruiting sites is it's very similar to what it used to be is okay. from talking with a lot of my friends and individuals that are interviewing is that the still the best way to to get in front of a, a recruiter is through a friend or a work colleague so the network is still critical um, so looking at LinkedIn, and you can find people that maybe you know or that you've come in contact with, uh, with individuals from uh, that have a lot of experience, but students who maybe don't have uh, a lot of work experience and they know of a company that they're interested in to reach out to the HR department and try to get somebody on the phone. And I know it's it's a little bit challenging right now due to people not working in the office. So if that's okay. the case, then yeah. get an email address and send a very professional email. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the, the third one is ask very appropriate questions during the, the interview. Um, and this goes for anyone, anyone that has like six months of experience to 40 years of experience is that research the company, research the person that's going to be interviewing you yes. and be very detailed with your questions. Ask three, four questions. If you have more, it's okay. And it shows a lot of interest and close with a very strong closing personal statement as to why you want to work for that organization. Hmm, very nice. Thank you so much. That was a lot. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it I was good. just going to get like one, two, three. <laughs> no, it was good. It was some really good, important tips. And like you said, it wasn't just for, for young people, but for anybody that's out there looking, because we are in a, a different time and a different way of doing things right now. So as much advice and tips we can get 
I say I'm, I'm well, I welcome them. So thank you for that. Absolutely. So again, I would like to thank you for coming to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. So to my listeners, make sure you make leave some comments, hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any more such episodes. And speaking of episodes, my next episode is going to be with Dr. Jennifer Cohen, where we're going to talk about the COVID and how she's helping families decide on taking the shot, the COVID injection, the vaccine, the (laughs) the, the vaccine. Yes. Uh, Have you had your shot? No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, you know what? They don't have a lot going around. They don't have a lot and it's not my turn. (laughs) Right. Right. So it's like, we'll see. (laughs) Exactly. So Casey, again, thank you so much for spending your time with me. It was a pleasure. And I look forward to us working together again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your time and Uh having me on and look forward to talking to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye.